Okay, so welcome back to the channel, Andrew. It is an absolute pleasure. This has been a long one in the making, but I've got some awesome questions to talk to you today about Alluvium and content creation. As everyone knows, I'm a content creator and you have been for much longer than myself. And I always yeah. love to, to nitpick down into your brain and get the best possible answers to my question, especially for those that haven't quite started content creation yet and want to get into it or want to explore that world. I think everyone should... Yeah at least bring themselves into that realm even a little bit, whether it's through writing or or music or whatever else, there's always something that you can be passionate about in this space. You just need to find out what that is. So there's definitely something for yeah. everyone. How are you going today? How is everything going? Everything is great. Thanks for asking, man. Uh, seriously, I, I couldn't be happier right now. I'm working on so many interesting projects, working with so many interesting people right now. I'm, I'm doing really well. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to kick off this one with a really simple question. You might have answered it before, and I'm really not sure. What is your favorite alluvial? My favorite alluvial? Ooh, that one's tough. Um, I think right now it is uh, Seer. Mm. Like without question. The savagery of Seer is just the aggression, the Omega ability, just the look of Seer just emitting like the power of lava and magma from it, from their body. Like everything about that character is super original and interesting to me and very savage and violent and vicious. And as the like Pokemon for adults that Alluvium mm. purports to be, that is adult to me. Like it is viciously <laughs> violent. Like I feel like Seer would like kill people and not give any shits about it. I like Seer. Seer is, is just pure violence and it's a really cool alluvial. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think he's a little bit of like a de facto in the top five for me because he works so well with mm. Scoriox. So I oh, yeah, and the Scoriox <laughs> combo is good. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I and also he's tanky, it, though, he's tanky DPS. I like oh, tanky yeah. DPS a lot with like in most games, you can take a bunch of damage and deal a bunch of damage. Isn't that the most fun character a lot of the time? <laughs> I mean, it's the same reason they had to change Overwatch, right? <laughs> it's They got five yep. on the field now because the two tank meta was just dumb. <laughs> yep, that's right. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so we'll get straight into it with content creation. So firstly, I'm going to go a little bit into your origin story here. When did you realize you wanted to create content? Like thinking all those years back. Hmm. Uh, like created at all or like for a living? What do you mean? Let's, let's say for a living. For a living? Okay. I knew I wanted to create content for a living in high school. So I'd say 11th grade. I mm. knew that. Uh, now, at the time, this was social media didn't exist at the time. So this was in the year 2000. Um, so we only had Web 1 at the time where the internet was read only. Uh, mm. So the only content you creation you could do at that time was be in theater. And so I was in the theater team. You, I was in the AV club and we could do things like motion tweens mm. and use uh, animation software to create uh, content, but there was nowhere to upload it. And then I was on the TV production crew. And I actually have in my journal from high school, I wrote um, in there that one day I'm going to make a company called AWOL Productions Inc. And I knew at that moment, like that was going to be what I do. I thought I was going to go into film when I went to college, uh, but I didn't end up going into film uh, because I was a total uh, F up when it comes to college. Uh, and I didn't do that. And instead, I spent my time in college um, creating electronic music and playing video games and then creating content for newgrounds.com. And those things were the closest thing we had maybe to Twitch and YouTube and Twitter and being a content mm -hmm. creator today. I couldn't get motivated to go to film school when this thing on the internet was happening that was so much more interesting of online gaming. And it was the very beginning of online content creation at that time. Uh, and so that's when I knew. I knew in 11th grade I was going to do this for a living. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I didn't know you made electronic music. Do you have any of that still stored up that we can have a listen to at some point? Yeah, I, I do have some of it on on CDs. So I'd have to find a way to burn them off of the CDs onto the internet. Um, I'm not sure if any of it. So I, I put some of it on this site called GarageBand.com. I think it's still mm -hmm. around um, where you could upload music and get people's feedback on it. That was mind bending at the time. 
that yeah. other people could listen to your music and tell you what they think of it. It was like the first time that it had ever happened in the world, uh, other than people being able to give you feedback in real life on your music in real life. Yeah. So some of it was on there. I'd have to, you know, I should probably rip that music and put it on the cloud to store it. Uh, so I'll probably do that. I look forward to it. Believe me. <laughs> it, it's not going to be good. It's going to be like dated 20 year old electronic music by someone who got to like a mid tier level of talent. I did professional music production for a while for mm. like pop artists. I did remixes and I made, I don't know, maybe $15,000 doing that, let's say, mm. but I never made a career out of music because I was never good enough at it. Fair enough. Fair or enough. maybe I, I mean, didn't have the drive. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely believe in playing to your strengths. I think, I feel like you can build as many strengths as you want to build, but I feel like playing to your strengths is always powerful. And, and some have more naturally inclined than others, of course, as well. Um, which is always the case with anything, right? So mm -hmm. what kind of was the first video you did or the first channel? Because you have quite a few channels, but I don't really yeah. know which one came first and, and which one was <laughs> the one you focused on and that sort of stuff. Kind of what so was you the don't, first sort of you content know. you focused on? Yeah, on, um, yeah you, don't know, you don't know what channel was my first channel. And the first video that I ever made isn't on the internet anymore. I privated it mm. uh, out of cringe. And maybe I shouldn't have done <laughs> that. I, I should probably go back and unprivate it. But the channel was called FTW Broadcasting, and that was in 2007, I think I made that on YouTube. And now the channel, I think, is called AWOL Gaming. I renamed it and rebranded it to try to make it into something else. But the first ever video I made and uploaded there was a StarCraft 1, I believe, eSports mm -hmm. commentary um, that I did as a just solo. And so I just recorded StarCraft, did a shout cast on top, and I did a bunch mm. of those by myself. And then I ended up bringing in my friend Danny um, to do it with me. And our concept was we we're going to do dual commentary. That was going to be our thing that was going to blow up the internet because nobody was doing <laughs> dual commentary. And then we and it ended up becoming this kind of like shit talking show where we were just kind of bantering with each other and there just happened to be StarCraft gameplay in the background. And it actually did pretty well. I mean, in like 2008, we were getting like five to 10,000 views per video on our StarCraft esports commentary. And we were some of the biggest StarCraft esports commentary guys at the time. But this was when no gaming channel had reached a million subscribers. Like it was a very small space. Mm. But that's where I got started. And then I ended up figuring out that I loved esports from that. And then we started, I started casting the Go4 SE2 series for the ESL. They're the largest. Mm. esports organization out there early and i was casting their replays and doing professional esports commentary and i loved that and so i thought to myself one day i would like to be hosting the biggest esports events in the world um and anyway that might that might happen with alluvium that's one of the reasons why i'm here that will happen with alluvium i'm telling you that much myself i think i think you definitely got something special here um, not just with the competitive gameplay, but the the overall IP that is being built. Um, yes, I yeah, agree. No, that's that's a really crazy story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so it's funny, and so that all, so the the story, the the insight for all of you, it's not just about me. The insight for all of you is, you might start somewhere, and then it might branch a little bit, but once you discover something that you really like, that can be a longer story arc than you know. Like my interest in esports, I did the initial esports videos. Then I brought my friends in. Then I did esports commentary. Then that led to me founding that gaming network, TGN. Then we did our own esports tournaments there. Then I ended up doing the official esports videos for Blizzard. And then now I might end up being uh, the person who directs esports for a AAA game. And so this is a this is a fun winding path over time where. If you discover something you love, you might not instantly get what the opportunity you think you're going to get in that area. But if you keep going towards opportunities in that area and you keep working at your skills in that area, mm. it might take you like it did me 15 years. It might take me 20 years from the first time that I made my first esports commentary video to be on stage hosting at an 80,000 person event for esports with Alluvium. It might have it might take me 20 years to make that happen, but eventually it will happen if you want it to. And so I've literally 
And I know this is cheesy, but I've literally just straight up told myself, that's what you're going to do one day. And I, it's going to happen because I told myself that's what's going to happen. That's mm. how this shit works. You can literally will whatever you want to happen in your career into existence by just simply willing it into existence. But the timeline might be longer than you think, and the amount of work that you need to put in might be longer than you think. Like just with esports and commentary for me, mm. I've put in about a thousand hours of work just into that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a long road, um, but I, I have similar goals in my life, and I'm only just starting to action on them now. So um, I'm excited to see where that heads, and it might not even be successful on the first try. It might take me a few, but um, yeah, I'm definitely excited to push that through to the end as well. Um, yeah, so the you, next, you, mm, you won't be sorry, successful on your first try, and if you're not <laughs> successful on your first try, that's better than being successful on your first try. It's better to fail. It really is. It, it makes you so much better. Um, if you fail and you don't get the results you want, oh my gosh, it helps you refine the idea, helps you refine your crap, refine your craft, and it helps you find the very specific thing that you are better than other people at naturally. So failure is very good, especially when you're getting started. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that being said, this is my first proper attempt at YouTube. I mean, the first two weren't that hard, but I guess I just didn't find what I was passionate for at the time. And and I got it right the third try. I mean, so far, so good anyways. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is is YouTube. So you're a big proponent of YouTube. We've had that discussion many times that if you had to start anywhere, YouTube, fantastic. TikTok's pretty good too, but we get the idea. So the thing I want to talk about is Facebook, I've been seeing recently, has run out of new users. Now, obviously, there's global recessions and things kind of starting, but, yeah. but um, oh, I can't even remember his name at the moment. He said that, Talking pretty about much Zuck? every yes Zuckerberg, um, he, he talks about pretty much that everyone on the planet that has easy access to Wi-Fi or a mobile phone, a computer, or whatever, pretty much has Facebook at this point. Obviously, yes. the active users is very different, but he's run out of people to give Facebook to, and That's that true. might be part of the reason Meta is starting to <laughs> Meta has started to take shape. Um, do you think YouTube will ever hit that sort of mass consumption where you just run out of people to show videos to? Yes. Yes, it will. Uh, and all of these things go in natural cycles. I think YouTube is, all, you know, it's growing consistently, but it'll plateau at some point. And tech companies don't pivot their business model and they don't pivot the appeal of their platform until they see a plateau in the numbers or they anticipate a decline. So the primary motivating factor for Mark Zuckerberg to uh, change the company's direction to Web3 is that his CFO came over to him and told him, we are not going to hit our targets in upcoming quarters. Here are the factors that I see. And we need to talk about how we're going to find a way for growth long term. I mean, Zuckerberg hasn't said that publicly, but I get 100% guarantee you that triggered Zuckerberg looking at uh, metaverse and VR and these that particular area as a way to monetize. YouTube is going to run into the same thing and all Web2 social media platforms are going to run into the same problem. Why? Because that's what happens with entrenched technology when new technology enters the space. The same thing happened to NBC, Universal, the same thing happened to CBS and ESPN and all the TV entities out there that came before social media started taking all their business. And then before that, all the print-based companies ran into the same issue when TV took their market share and took their advertising revenue. And before that, radio stations and radio broadcasting took the hit, et cetera, et cetera. We see this cycle play out over and over again. As soon as there's a better broadcasting technology and a more engaging way to communicate information to other humans, it soaks up the attention, then it soaks up the advertising dollars, and the entrenched players react five to 10 years after that new technology drops to try to fix the problem as their business is declining. That's what mm. we're seeing with Meta. And so will that be the case for YouTube and for Google and Apple and all of them? Yes, yes it will. And will most of them not make it 10 to 15 years from now in terms of being a juggernaut? Yes, they will not be the big company. Go look at the top companies in the stock market from 20 years ago. There's a bunch of names on there you ain't never heard of, guys, if you're young. Uh, you ever heard of Enron? 
Probably no. not. Used to be the biggest company in the world. It was at the top of the list. Vaporized. So anyway, the point is new technology will replace YouTube at some point. So your job, everybody, is to harvest as much free attention from social media platforms as you can today. And when you see a new platform emerge, emerge that you think looks promising, also distribute your content there. Mm -hmm. Don't don't um, only distribute your content there or, or abandon a current platform. That's why I've always been a preaching restreaming, streaming to multiple platforms to get more reach, uploading your content on every platform to hit every single algorithm, and then most importantly, collecting the emails and phone numbers and personal information of your viewers so that you can contact them directly. You don't want to have your audience and your business as a creator be entirely dependent on some algorithms on some social media, media platform. You need to be able to reach your customers and your viewers directly. And as long as you're on someone else's platform to do that, you'll always be at the mercy of those platforms and you'll always be trying to run up a waterfall that's constantly rushing beneath you. You can never get to the top. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I think that's really good advice. And that's the, the sort of thing I was looking for is um, I'm always concerned about falling into obscurity and things like that. And I just, I want to make sure that I have a clear clear path forward and, and you know more than anyone, um, in my opinion, about, about a lot of this stuff. Um, one thing, you, really quick, one thing you can take away no matter what, a lot of people like, acquiring audience and attention and like that's the currency they want to hold on to that's cool one thing you can do is just make money and guess what you can do with money money lasts through time <laughs> and so the money you collect today from your business today can equal attention in the future because the next media thing you do you can hire an editor and have premium equipment and have a great website and have premium branding and the money you make today can accelerate your attention mm -hmm. gathering in the next one. And so a lot of people think I've got to keep my followers. I've got to keep the views up. I've got to keep, you know, all of that's good. But if you make money, the money is a way for you to almost store the energy and the value you acquired from those viewers, and then move it forward in time in a different format. So don't underestimate money. And if you do make a decent number amount of money or any amount of money as a creator, and you don't need it, then consider investing it so that it grows over time. So that next media project that you do, you'll have even more money. And then you'll be able to get an even greater head start and have a team of people to do everything for you. That would really accelerate the progress, right? So yeah, don't definitely. forget the financial aspect and be researching and becoming financially literate uh, because the finance aspect of running a media business is as important, if not more important than the attention gathering part, which is what everybody uh, everybody. Uh, is obsessed with with getting subs getting likes getting views mm. that's only half of the equation and creators that focus on that half of the equation and are good at it most of the time they're not good at the finance side and they fail for that reason yeah yeah it's it's a concern with anything we even hear lots of stories about famous um famous pro athletes and things like that uh, going broke shortly after they their careers finished because Either they didn't have a backup plan or they just didn't manage their finances accordingly. Like really they'd only need to yeah. invest maybe 10% to just have income and cash flow over the rest of their life. Yeah. So it, it feels shocking on the surface, but it's definitely just a part of that, that thing that everyone needs to get educated on at some point in their life. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is regards more to newer content creators and people who haven't started their journey yet is do you think more time on YouTube makes a major difference in the context of if you didn't really improve so much and you were consistent? So for example, if someone produced videos for five years and they were they were decently good, but they never they were never really amazing or anything, and they never really pushed them up to that level or did a lot of market research or anything, do you think that makes a big difference as opposed to someone who's just been doing it for a year, but their video content is just that much better? Um, it's all about it's all learning. So the reason why the top creators on YouTube are the top creators on YouTube, not only did they make more videos than you in most cases for a longer period of time, but they learned something every time they made a video and improved mm. the next video. That's why it worked for them. I know a number of grinders. There's this one guy, Rurikon, 
uh, who is a full-time creator and he's been doing this as long, longer than me. He started before I did <laughs> and it took him 1200 videos on his YouTube channel until he ended up getting like a hundred thousand subscribers or something on his YouTube channel. And the mm -hmm. point of sharing that is working hard matters. Sticking with it matters, definitely. But he would have succeeded much, much faster had he improved his content video over video and he had um, created content that was designed to grow. But instead, he just wanted to make the type of content he wanted to make and he did it in the way he wanted to do it and he wasn't focused on improvement as much. And mm. so you choose your path. If you make 100 videos and you prove you improve significantly video over video over 100 videos, you'll be getting tons of views or maximum amounts of views in your niche. And if you're only improving a little bit or barely at all over 1000 videos, you aren't going to be that far. And so you have to think of releasing videos not as not so much as a grind, but as a learning opportunity in each video. Mm. In every single video, you you should aim Every single episode of a show I do, I aim to improve one. My goal is actually to improve two tangible things you can see on the screen or hear or learn in every video I do. So every explainer you see I do with Alluvium will be better than the previous one. Hopefully every episode of Alluvium Insider and Alluvium Showcase and whatever the hell name shows we come up with will be better than the previous one. In some, you might not notice, but over time I notice and I know what I did and I'm just stacking those bricks one by one until eventually, if you go back and look at a historical episode, it's cringy by comparison. And so it's about improving video over video. It's not grinding video over video. A lot of people mm. get that wrong and they burned out. They burn out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I did, especially in my earlier days, I definitely did a lot of improvement on myself and trying to figure out what I could make better. I've done a little bit of less of that in, in recent times, but... um. But I've always got it in the back of my mind, and I'm always working towards that that goal for sure. Um, yeah, and that's so, why your channel's not growing right now. I'm just gonna be honest; you aren't <laughs> growing right now because you stopped trying to improve. Yeah, yeah, no, 100. percent It's just like it's you'll see your those... timeline growing, and then like you stop trying to improve, and like you plateaued. Like your success is directly proportional to how much you focus on improving. Mm. It's 100 percent in your control. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's not much more to say on that. I couldn't agree more. Um, and yeah, I will notice that I'll do a video that's a little bit more outside of my comfort zone and I will see, I'll see really decent growth. A, a good example is there's some shorts I did recently that were quite different, um, but unique, interesting, and very good for, for people to watch that people really enjoyed it. And they didn't get many views, but they did actually get quite a, a bit more growth than some of my other content did. So it, it really goes to show that it can make a big difference, even when it, that even though it might not look like that on the surface. Yep. Um, so the next thing we'll go into is <laughs> obscurity. I've already asked that one. Um, many want to know about the monetization tools available to creators. So you've obviously got ad, re ad revenue and things. If you had to give us a top three monetization tools you would recommend or that you have used, or you think are easy or maybe just a yeah. best, not necessarily easy. What would you say? No, yeah, it's it's easy for me to say this. So I when I when I did when I worked at Broadband TV, like everything the whole business was started as us monetizing content for creators. And then we layered services on top of that to help them monetize. And then and then I went and advised creators as well to help them monetize. And it's really, really clear to me what the best sources of revenue are. Mm. So the number one best source for any content creator is affiliate revenue. Without question. Uh, so what do I mean by affiliate revenue? Literally every software platform and uh, platforms like Amazon, as an example, have an affiliate program. And also all types of services from food delivery services to Uber to your password manager to your every piece of hardware and everything for sale on Amazon and other sites, Newegg.com, literally everything you can buy is pretty much in an affiliate program somewhere. And so what you do is you create a piece of content uh, related to that piece of uh, that product or that service, 
and you get people's attention with an informative and educational piece of content related to that. It could even be about the product if you want it to be, and you provide value, and you create an evergreen video that can be watched for, for five years from now that answers an important question and teaches somebody something. And in that video, you tell them if they're interested in purchasing such and such product related to this video, there's a link in the description below. It is an affiliate link, and I get a small cut if you end up buying using my link. That is the number one easiest way to make recurring revenue and significant recurring revenue as a content creator. So as somebody just on my own, uh, creating videos on my AWOL digital channel, one of like seven or something I have, um, <laughs> just, just with 200,000 views per month, how much money per month do you think I was making in affiliate revenue just on Amazon? 200,000 views per month. It's not that much. It's more, a lot more than I get. Um, how much? Thousand US? Ten thousand dollars per month US just in Amazon affiliate revenue. What? So if it was <laughs> just, so with that number of views, just with YouTube revenue, you'd make like a thousand dollars per month. Yeah. With your US audience. But if you have affiliate revenue, you make way more money. And check this out. I haven't released a, a new video on any of my channels, I haven't recorded a new video for my affiliate revenue in, in, a year, in over a year since I joined Alluvium. Every month, it still pays me $4,000 per month in passive income just from the videos that are just sitting on the internet. And I have done nothing over the last year to contribute to that revenue. Now, it was at 10,000. And now that I completely ignore that business, it's declined to 4,000. But that's all affiliate revenue. So the point of sharing that is to say that affiliate revenue creates consistent month over month revenue that can pay your bills and create as a create a foundation for your media business. Mm. Do you use any products? Yes. There's an affiliate program for that. The best affiliate programs are number one, Amazon's influencer and partnership program. Number one, that's by far number one. Number mm. two, impact.com. So impact.com. Um, is an affiliate website that has partnerships with every company that does affiliate programs, basically. And so I guarantee you there's a bunch of products in there that you like, that you could talk about, where you could make revenue, affiliate revenue off of recommending. So number one is affiliate revenue without question. And guys, I'm not trying to bat brag about how much money I made or something like that. <laughs> um, that's not what it's about for me, really. No. Uh, it, it, I, I did that at that time because I had quit my executive job over at that publicly traded media company and I needed a way to pay the bills. And I had learned how to do affiliate marketing and I had taught creators how to do it. And I decided, why not make money using the techniques I've taught other people? So affiliate number one. Number two, best type of revenue is sponsorships. So sponsorship revenue um, from brands um, is great. So you can make recurring monthly sponsorships with brands that uh, you like, where you like their equipment and what have you. These light mm -hmm. bulbs up here and the lights in the background that you see here, it's from a company called Govi. Govi paid me $3,000 per month or something, two or $3,000 per month to promote their products on Amazon and to make tutorial videos and shit like that. Plus they paid me affiliate revenue on top of that. This one partnership, me just talking about these lights, I think I made like $40,000 off of that. Just me talking about fucking lights, dude. So sponsorships are incredible. And you can either get an agency to get you sponsorships. There are also sponsorship platforms that will connect brands with partners. YouTube is starting to do that. Uh, Amazon is starting to do that. And there's a number of websites you can go to out there where you can put in your channel, put in your data, and you can they will come to you. The sponsors will come to you and solicit you or sponsored videos, or sponsored mid-rolls on your channel. Just an instant infusion of cash into your business so that you can uh, not just pay your bills, but maybe build your business faster. So sponsorships are number two. Mm. And then number three would be recurring subscription revenue, I would say. And so what do I mean by that? I mean uh, platforms like Patreon, uh, Twitch subs, YouTube channel members, um, soliciting your hardcore audience to provide you recurring monthly subscription revenue. 
Uh, if you can get off of those platforms and you can create your own on your own website, obviously that's better. Mm. Uh, but that recurring subscription revenue is something you can count on and hit on a regular basis. Those are the top three revenue streams, affiliate revenue, sponsorship revenue, and recurring subscription revenue, with affiliate revenue being by far uh, number one. Uh, source of uh, revenue for creators that it's underlooked and is underutilized and you don't have to go chase a bunch of views to go make, get YouTube partnership or people are like I need oh, yeah I got Twitch partnership it's like who cares you aren't gonna be able to make a living with that you need to go get affiliate revenue and sponsorships if you want to make a living I guess I guess the only thing that's that's popped into my head when I'm trying to think about because I've never really attempted it myself. So obviously I have no idea what I'm talking about. But the, the first thing that comes into my head is like, how are you getting those 200,000 viewers to go and watch for the affiliate stuff? Is it just really good search optimization? Or is there something else that's kind of occurring there? Or is it just your channel's big enough that YouTube's really recommending you a lot? I, I don't really, I, I don't quite get that side of the equation. Yeah, there is no channels big enough where you get views. That That's not a thing. So big channels, if they release a shitty video, get like no views. Mm. And little channels that make an amazing video get a ton of views. Mm. It's about making search optimized content, yes, that doesn't waste anybody's time, gets straight to the point, and answers questions and teaches people things. And a lot of the videos that made me the most money, I made this one that was like the two best webcams ever or something on my channel. <laughs> and it was like, that one's at a million views or something. Literally, I just start the video with the two best webcams ever are these two webcams, the Logitech Brio and the Logitech 920. In this video, I'm going to show you the way they look, how to use them and set them up. Okay, here's the Logitech Brio. And I just tell you the information you were looking for. Mm. So all of the comments on that video was, thank God somebody finally cut the bullshit and just told me what I wanted to know. As opposed to everybody else that's, yo guys it's your boy harlem here <laughs> and thank you so much for tuning in be sure to ding ding ring the bell and smash that like button because i'm all about tech videos in here real quick i know you guys have been wondering i haven't been uploading as many videos as recently but guess what sorry i have my cousin's house and all this stuff but anyway you don't want to hear about that and without further ado let's get into it so why didn't that video get views because the retention in the first 30 seconds was awful. And if you're the type of creator that would deliver that type of intro, you're probably going to waste their time for the rest of the video too. And so people want, people click videos and videos get views, a lot of videos over views over time. If you don't waste their time, people are on YouTube searching for the answers to questions to save time. So if you focus on saving people time, not telling them the most mind-blowing information, mm -hmm. not SEO optimizing in the best way, save them time. Your viewer retention on your video will be impeccable. And even if your thumbnail is garbage, people are gonna watch that video and the algorithm is gonna recommend it for years and years because it saves people time. Time is the most limited resource humans have it's the most precious resource humans have. And if you can save people the most precious resource they have, you will be rewarded for it handsomely. Yeah, I think I think a good way I like to think about it is, is YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. And if you look at the first largest search engine in the world, which is obviously Google, I mean, which owns YouTube, so that's, that's always fun, um, which is Google. When you type in a Google question, I very, I've actually lately very rarely click on the search results. Google will actually pop up with some key information inside one of the top key hits. And that if that answers my question, I'm happy with Google. <laughs> and because it saved I, you I time. Really like to, yeah, because I really like to think of YouTube in the same way. And that yes. was the, the, we were talking about my improvements before. That was the big improvement I fixed. Obviously, I had that lengthy intro. I used to introduce myself and all that sort of stuff. And I it just, it's, it saves me time editing too. I mean, I can't complain. <laughs> But that's one type of strategy. So you're wondering, how, that's how I got views on that channel. Mm. There are other channels that use different strategies to get views, uh, but they follow the same saves you time principle. So if you look at the best YouTuber that has ever existed in the entire mm. world, Mr. Beast, 
How did his video start? Blam, here we are at a pool. I've got $2 million behind me. And here's Jessica. She's going to blah, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's some edits. Sorry, my camera went out of focus there. But she's going to try to <laughs> go in the here and do whatever challenge in the pool. And this is what's happened. Just watch it right now. She does it. All right, now that that challenge is over, we're into challenge number two. Let's get into the next part. All right, so now we're at the house. And like, he doesn't waste a single nanosecond of your time entertaining you. Mr. Beast, the number one thing he does that's better than everyone else is he respects your time. If you clicked a video, Mr. Beast video, he does not take that for granted. He understands that every second of your time and your viewership should be jam motherfucking packed with the most entertainment possible. And if he doesn't have the content to show you that is wildly entertaining in that moment, it's cut. That's what the best yeah. YouTubers do. The best creators do. They don't waste your time. I've, I've you heard just think about, about think about that. Point. Like if you're like, I want to explain this concept in crypto. I want to uh, talk. I want to do commentary on such and such topic. Do it, but don't waste anyone's time. Don't waste a single second. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I've I've heard Mr. Beast speak about that time and time again, and that's that's pretty much all he does. And he says sometimes he cuts like. 99% of the content that he's actually shot or whatever um, yes. to get the point across. And and yeah, every single second does something useful. And and that's that's hard to master, obviously, but um, I definitely want to work towards it. And I know with your help, I can. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so this is a few more questions to do with kind of being newer to, newer to YouTube and things like that. Is, is there a, you talk about if you make a good video, it'll get views. If we table that for the time being, but that that's my that's my consensus as well. Um, that's kind of the the end goal. But if you wanted to spread it even further, whether it's paying for ads or whatever else, are there are there really good ways to spread your YouTube content to try and grow a bit faster that you can think about? There are none. No, just make good videos. You so it's it's two it's two pieces. Uh, so there is no way to fast track the growth of a YouTube video. YouTube cannot be gamed. So YouTube used to be able to be gamed uh, in the <laughs> in like 2008, and before it had the algorithm changes that focused on click through rate and focused on audience retention. Now that the now that the algorithms focus on that, you cannot game the system. You can't pay for ads because ads might have a good click through rate but they have a terrible audience retention. So that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You can't drive lots of external traffic in there and pay for clicks or whatever from external sources because that might have a high click-through rate, but that will have a bad audience retention. And you can't bot a bunch of uh, high retention views mm -hmm. uh, from a website because YouTube's algorithms are the best at detecting that. And they filter all that data before it actually affects the reach of the video. And if they detect any foul play, your video is dead in the water. So there is no way to, quote unquote, accelerate the growth of a YouTube video after it's already been released. I have tried everything. I mean, <laughs> I've tried everything. Everything there is. I don't want to even say publicly some of the things I've tried, but I've done all of it. <laughs> and none of it works. So it used to work. So fun, fun fact, back in the day in the gaming space, you used to be able to make a gaming channel. And let's say it was like the, 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 the meta in 2008 was record some Call of Duty footage. Just talk over the top of it about your day. And then the thumbnail is a picture of a girl with huge boobs. <laughs> and then tell everyone to like the video. And that was it. And then you got like you got like a lot of views. You got like a hundred thousand views if you did that. That doesn't fly in today's algorithm though, because people would click for boobs. They wouldn't get boobs. Then you're just talking. They thought they were getting a Call of Duty video, but you're not really talking about Call of Duty. And so now the algorithm has eliminated that type of nonsense. But mm -hmm. back in the day, you were able to game the system because it was based on clicks, interactions, and views. The bigger the numbers were there, the more reach you would get on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so you could game it for that reason. Now it's just click-through rate and audience retention, which are the ultimate measures of quality. So yeah. when I say make better videos and get more views, that's only half true. 
So you can increase your click-through rate by having more interesting topics, by having better titles and better thumbnails. Okay, you can increase your audience retention by doing the thing I just said a moment ago, mm. not wasting people's time and jam-packing every F and second of the video with only the things they clicked for and nothing they didn't click for. That's number two. But none of that works. The other half of the equation is there needs to actually be a market for that type of video. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people ignore. They think like, I made the best video about this topic. Why didn't it get views? Well, maybe it got the most views it could possibly get. Maybe 500 views was literally all the humans that cared about that. <laughs> um, and so I think a lot like market research is important, uh, especially in gaming in particular. People will make content about games they think are big. But when they didn't actually do the research on how many people are on YouTube or various platforms actually watching content about that mm. game, like actually. Uh, and so you have to have a market for the content, for your good content to actually get traction. I think you touched on it a second ago, but the other big question I had for you um, was actually ideas. Now, Mr. Beast obviously also talks about this a lot where a good idea is really that key, that key identity in terms of getting a video that's viral, right? Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to ask you about is your creative process, that an idea generating process. I've had a bit more of a Eureka recently and talking about improving, I improved my thumbnails. Actually, I found a new thumbnail process and, and I did see a significant increase in growth um, and click through and everything. Like you your thumbnails believe. are so, significantly better now. Yeah, your thumbnails are like a seven out of ten now. They're way better. Yeah, yeah. Even more recently, I had another another stroke of uh, Frobe helped me with something. And anyways, the idea generation side of things is something I haven't quite looked into enough inside myself yet. But I'd love to understand your creative process. How do you go about finding a good idea for a video, or how did you when you were producing a lot of content, or even for Alluvium? Sure. Yeah. I'm still producing a lot of content and helping people with ideas all, all the time. Um, so here's what you have to do with that. It's kind of like um, you listen to really prolific writers like John Grisham, who writes like a book every year. He's like the mm. best selling author of all time, I guess, other than the Bible, I guess. Um, what they do is they're just always writing. He says, like, I, he writes multiple hours per day. It doesn't matter. Every single day, he just writes, 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 writes. And he gets the ideas out of his head onto a piece of paper or a computer or whatever. And a lot of those ideas are bad. But it doesn't matter because he's constantly writing. And so just out of sheer quantity of content <laughs> and the sheer will that John Grisham has to get as many freaking books out there as possible mm. the most prolific writer of all time and also some some good ideas come out of his head right some really good ideas that became iconic intellectual properties in global culture so the reason why i share that is that's what i so when i was at broadband tv and i had we did like 1500 videos a year or i work with a client a lot of like uh, clients, and I still have a few clients. I don't have that many though because Alluvium is so taxing. <laughs> uh, but a few <laughs> clients I still work with. All the big creators I work with that have millions of subscribers that I currently work with, mm. the only thing they want to talk to me about is video ideas, because that's the only part they have a tr they have trouble with. And so, what do they do? What do the best creators do? They have a giant spreadsheet full of hundreds and thousands of ideas that they're constantly adding to. And what they end up doing is filtering the best ideas toward the top. Uh, so here's the process, everybody. If you're looking to make some content in a particular area, what you do is you go incognito search the terms related to that topic. Mm. And you go find the page one results and the names of those videos and you put them into a spreadsheet. So let's say you were making a video about uh, crypto investing. You would type in crypto, put in the top 10 titles into your spreadsheet. Crypto investing, top 10 titles. Crypto finance, top 10 titles. Crypto, whatever. And then you're gonna put in like 100 YouTube titles into the spreadsheet, and you're gonna start to see a pattern. What you're probably gonna notice is that there's only 
four types of videos that get created about crypto finance, investing, and what have you that actually work. And they fall into the buckets of maybe a list video, maybe they fall into the buckets of bearish clickbait or bullish clickbait or whatever it may be. And you're going to narrow down the top four formats that actually work for that particular niche. And then you will isolate those four formats. Then you're going to take the best practices that the creators are using to get views with those four formats. And you're going to literally write out the titles of their videos as if it were an equation with X and Y in the equation. And you fill in X and Y with whatever you're going to make your video about. So if it's top five X things you were wrong about in 2022 or in Y, which is a year, you know that all you need to do to get views is to fill in X and Y. That's how you pump them out. And that's how you get millions of views per month. That's how the big boys do it. I've set up the system with the top creators in the world. Well, some of the top creators in the world, at least the English speaking ones. And that's how I systematically approach it with them. They tend to think of ideas nilly willy and they have some like really banger ideas from time to time. But if you could put a system into place like that, that at least gives you a starting place for ideas where you don't have to come up with things from scratch regularly. You know what the winning formula is and you're just working within the formula all the time. And occasionally you'll have an idea that breaks the formula that does really well, but you hit the formula over and over and over again. Why is every movie the same? Why is every TV show the same? Why is every book the same? Why is every piece of media on every platform the same? It's because through billions and billions of pieces of data, billions and billions of views, billions of dollars, there's a specific format that just literally is better than the other formats. The sooner you recognize that and the sooner you follow that format, the sooner you can become a master and become one of the top players utilizing that format. That's yeah, the secret. Yeah, I I have exploited that two or three times. <laughs> I yes yes no I'm I'm actually quite familiar with that and I don't do it very much at the moment. Um, but I will actually ask a question on I don't do that heaps. Is alluvium doesn't well doesn't so much have a formula in terms of alluvium itself, right? Um, and I I stumbled upon something lucky with my spreadsheets early on as well, which was something that no one else had really done in Alluvium either. Um, if I were to adapt someone else's thing into Alluvium instead, what would you kind of talk about that? Like, because Alluvium doesn't really have those formulas stapled in yet. And I feel like they will be. And maybe I'll be one of those people that helps set those trends even for people. I, I find whatever yeah. works and other people copy that or whatever. Um, but how, how would you suggest kind of converting it? Also, Let's so let's let's go into that. So if there was a different if you had a niche, say something that hasn't really been done before, how would you go about generating ideas for that niche? Go find a similar niche that is big. Alluvium's not big. A, a, a similar niche that is big and then go copy their video formats and do it in Alluvium. So what I would if I was an Alluvium creator, what I would do is I would go search for the top 20 TFT videos. And I would also search for like the top 20, like DeFi gaming, crypto gaming, NFT gaming type of videos, metaverse mm -hmm. videos. And I would put those videos into a spreadsheet and then I would just copy those formats. And I would do a mixture of like half metaverse DeFi NFT type content that talks about the technology, maybe the, uh, asset aspect of it or ownership or whatever the web three stuff. And then do the other half as gaming content that copies the top gaming video formats. And then I would see which one sticks and then I'd see which one does well. And the other key part to tell you is once you do that and you do have something that does well, the biggest YouTubers are the ones that recognize that they found a winner and then they kill all the losers with fire. So, uh, <laughs> the, so uh, there's a channel M and J TV is like the classic example I like to bring up when I started with him, 
he was getting about like 40,000 views per video on his channel. Pretty good as a Pokemon creator. Mm. We then sat down in a spreadsheet. We looked at all of the video formats on his channel. I logged them all by type. And I said, look, there's only two types of videos that do well on your channel. List videos and something else, whatever it was. I forget what it was. I recommend you stop doing every other type of content and only do, do those. And if you do, you'll probably get 10 times more views. And he didn't believe me. He dabbled around. He came back three months later. He goes, okay, I'm going to do it. Just help me understand how to do it. Within six months, he was getting 400,000 views per video. Jeez. So the point is on a particular channel, once you find a winner, double down on the winner. If, you, if making top five metaverse videos or top five NFTs to look at this week or top five reasons you were wrong about whatever or whatever the video format is, videos, exceedingly outperform the other videos on your channel, you should immediately stop producing all other types of videos and just produce that type of video over and over and over and over again until you master it and you see whether you can juice it out. Most of the time when creators do that, their channel explosively grows. But a lot of creators make that winning video and then go, oh, that was just a one-off. Was it? Or did you just find the winner and just shove it under the carpet? So what any creator that's watching this right now should do is sort their channel by most popular Whatever your most popular video was, go make 50 of those right now. I guarantee you'll get way more views than you're currently getting. Mm, all right, I'll do that. It's not that hard. We'll it's look. really not that hard. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the easiest strategy ever. They're like, oh, yeah. yeah, well, I made that video a while ago, and I've justified in my own head why I don't think that's going to work anymore because these complicated reasons. Shut up and just do what works if you want to grow. And if you're saying all those other complicated reasons about why you don't want to do it, it's because you don't actually want to be successful. You just want to sabotage yourself. And that's your own personal problem I can't fix. <laughs> I, th I think it's really interesting because sometimes, especially when it comes to growth and success and money and things like that, a lot of people instantly get into the mindset of, if you want to be successful, you have to work really, really hard. And obviously you've got work smarter and not harder and it falls a bit into this category. And the best example I can think of is if working hard to produce YouTube content was the only way you could be successful on YouTube, then React videos would not exist. <laughs> like React videos, I'd argue, are some of the easiest pieces of content you can create. And yet mm -hmm. there are thousands of channels that have been highly successful doing React videos it's easy but it's a good idea and people enjoy watching it and that's really all that matters yep yeah that, that once again that is that those creators that make those react videos tried out a couple reactions on their mm -hmm. channel and then they were the ones that were smart enough when they saw the reactions doing better to kill every other type of content on their channel and just quadruple down on reactions i had a content creator i was working with a magic channel like literally like street magic uh, he was doing like challenges where he was like handcuffing himself in the pool. He was doing <laughs> card tricks to girls on the street. He was trying everything, man. He was working really, really hard on magic videos. And then he decided that I, he was just going to react to America's Got Talent and the when the magicians went on. 50 times more views than the other ones. So what I told him is double down on that and kill everything else with fire. He did. And his channel explosively grew. It's not that hard here, guys. <laughs> yeah. Let's smash it out. So firstly, how important is content in video games, whether it be before or after release? Content in video games? What do you mean that? What do you mean? Um, con uh, content as it regards to video games, trailers, gameplay videos, all that sort of stuff. Oh, for marketing games? I mean, it's everything now. For marketing, you mean? Uh, not just for marketing, but yeah. Okay. Inclu yeah, marketing. I mean, it's kind of, it's like essential now. So I would say that um, all the CMOs and like marketing executives I talk to in gaming, they're pretty much looking at video content in particular as being like almost the entire marketing strategy mm. for their games now. And... 
creating, uh, so they're looking at videos as being almost the entire content strategy and, and marketing strategy for their games mm -hmm. and for anything they're making now. So it's really important for them to make in-house videos that are like explaining what their brand is about, telling their story, and then showcasing their product. And then 100% of CMOs now are like, and it's all about our influencer marketing strategy. Now, hold on a second. I thought it was all about advertising. What happened? It used to be all about advertising five years ago. What shift just occurred? And the answer is Web2 is on its way out and it's dying. Apple and Google and Facebook aren't playing with each other anymore in terms of advertising because their advertising businesses are dying. This is what happens when an entrenched player, their CFO goes to the CEO and says, look, man, our main business model, it isn't growing anymore and it's going to decline. So what do you do? When you're number one, you put up the castle walls. You keep anybody from getting in and you try to hold on to your ground and your position. Mm -hmm. And so Apple shut off Facebook's access to their platform for ads. Google is doing the same. And they're all just trying to desperately hold on to their positioning in the market. So what does that mean? That means that advertising is becoming less and less effective. It's becoming more and more expensive for the results, leaving what remaining as a way to gain reach on all of these platforms cutting out the centralized entity in the middle and going straight to the influencer. And so influencer marketing is skyrocketing and it's really critical that you work with influencers and you come up with original concepts and you're constantly working with them in the future. It's way more important than an adver advertising budget. So if I were to guess, uh, by the end of this decade, I would say that the vast majority of gaming in particular, and certainly Alluvium, uh, a marketing budget will be spent on influencer marketing and producing original video content in-house by far. Uh, and maybe some other platform or some other method will come up in the meantime. But the reason why all that stuff is great is an advertisement is like, uh, is like a flame or a firework. You shoot it and it goes pew, and then it vaporizes forever. You don't get any yield out of that advertisement after the advertisement is over and gone and paid for. Whereas a piece of influencer content could get a million views between now and five years from now. Your own videos could get a million views between now and five years from now. Uh, and they keep paying dividends over time. And so we have found, in my opinion, a better model. Create your own in-house video content as your core and then the influencers extend the reach of that content and your brand. Uh, and there's really less and less reason to pay centralized advertising agencies moving forward. And that's going to spell, of course, the death of Web 2. And then we'll move into Web 3. And then we'll pay for something else to get people's attention in Web 3. I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but it'll be something. Yeah, yeah. It's it's certainly crazy, and we're we're seeing a lot of the earnings discussions and things as these companies release their earnings, and and advertising is a clear one that keeps keeps on popping up. So, the other thing I want to talk about, back to ideas a little bit, is with Alluvium so transparent, like with their leaks and everything. How do you find exciting content to share with people? <laughs> how do you how do you go? This is an idea I can share that people haven't already seen, and I can spark curiosity and all the rest of it. Yeah, so it, it's the burden is on the creatives to make something interesting. Um, I don't know if we released it on socials yet, but you know, how many? I mean, how many rocks can we show, right? <laughs> so uh, that's not exciting, right, anymore. Um, but there are things the team is creating that are new and exciting. So, for example, Grant just sent me a three D rendering of an Atlas plushie. <gasps> that's exciting. People want that. Um, I was I wasn't expecting that, and so that's something I gave to the social media team to share. And it's like a Atlas plushie spinning around in 3D. So the creative team has to be creative. That's that's it, and they have to do the unexpected, and they have to keep presenting stuff that people are not um, expecting. And so I think that's what the Alluvium brand has been really good at up until this point. The alluvials are kind of unexpected in style. The story, you guys have. The lore is so unexpected and it's weird. 
everything about it is unexpected and weird. And so Alluvium is good at delivering something that you didn't think you were gonna get. So that's mm -hmm. how. Uh, and as soon as the creative team starts getting samey in terms of what we're doing, um, that's probably the point where we're very successful. And then we become the, the entrenched player that's trying to hold on to our market share and just be careful. Uh, but at this phase, we're willing to take lots of risks, do lots of new things, bring in fresh talent, and just let them run with their ideas. That's how you get fresh ideas nonstop. And Kieran is excellent at bringing in people with fresh ideas and just letting them run with them and not micromanaging them. It's, that's why you see so much fresh and wild and weird and interesting things coming out of Alluvium. It's because the leadership allows it to happen and encourages it. That's very different than everywhere else where they want to button things up, they want to have control over the message, and they want mm. to centralize creativity and centralize the messaging. Illuvium's doing the opposite. And so it's by design, structurally, that Illuvium will release more interesting things than any other game studio because they let it happen. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I think creativity is key and I'm a creative myself. So I absolutely love it when I, I'm able to run with my own idea. And that, I mean, that just makes you work harder too. It's just a simple fact, right? I mean, if, if you want people that work for you to work harder, also a simple fact, right? So it, it, it makes sense in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> creative people will work harder for you if you let them do the crea their creative ideas. Mm -hmm. And they will make something better for you if you let their creativity run wild. Like the videos I produce with Andy, the reason why Andy and I work so well together is I just give him very clear direction. I give him the assets he needs and I let him know what's in my head. And I don't tell him how to execute at all. I just let him execute in however he wants. And mm -hmm. so the videos come out better that way. And Kieran, when it comes to the videos I make, like the explainers or whatever, we got a bunch, by the way, in the pipe that are coming out, but he he will just tweak the script. Not once has he commented on any of the graphics or the sound effects or anything in these videos. He might say something about the messaging, like, eh, we can't really say that anymore because we changed the product. <laughs> that happens all the time. <laughs> but other than that, man, he just lets it happen. And so the more freedom you give talented, creative people to be talented and creative, the more they'll produce for you. That's it. Mm. Um, so I've got two more key questions here. So firstly, a really quick one. Do you know if there will be any video content inside Alluvium? I've to I don't know how to explain it, but like if you're walking around the overworld and there's going to be video content on the wall or something advertising Alluvium yeah. Zero or something like, do you have any plans like yeah. that? Uh, screens with video content in the game? I haven't I seen that. I'm not sure how that. you would do it. I haven't seen that. Cinematic sequences, yes. Mm. So there, there awesome. are cinematics. There are cinematics being produced right now to tell the story of the game. Like really nice cinematics that will be in the mm. game to tell the story of the game. Uh, think like cutscene type of cinematic yeah. that tells key story points as you're progressing through the story. So those have all been in the pipe for a while and have been getting produced. Those I are happening, but that. that's not like on it. That's not like a screen. Oh shit! I don't know if I just revealed something. Oopsie! Those are all being produced right now. Yeah. I mean, I was probably assumed, but I hadn't really thought about it in depth before. And I'm excited they're being made. So that's really, really awesome. So yeah, oopsie doopsie. Thing... Maybe maybe that's a first or something that nobody said anything about it. But yeah, those are being produced. Um, those are those are all happening, uh, and they're needed. I think, and they're going to be the best format to tell some of the more complex mm -hmm. aspects of the story um, where doing like a normal cut scene or something with the 3d models in the game wouldn't be as good. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, I'm excited to see them. I'm excited to see the lore and everything. It's been hyped up so much. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, so the last thing I'll ask you about is the Alluvium series that is going to be produced down the road. Now I want to bring this into a kind of a Pokemon context where Pokemon, the video games, are about 1% of their revenue. Well, maybe a little bit more, but they're not much. Their anime, TV shows, movies, all that sort of stuff is the big part of their Pokemon media franchise. The, are you planning to produce an Alluvium series in the future? Think Cyberpunk Edgerunners or Arcane. 
Um, and like, how far is Alluvium going to take that stuff? Is it going to, do you think it might be bigger than the game one day? I'll be, I need to be careful how I answer this question. So, um, <laughs> is it under construction? Uh, so, um, all right. Do I think like ancillary revenue streams like merchandise and shows and all esports and all of these other things will be the majority of revenue? Definitely. So Illuvium is got like such an iconic brand and branding and characters. It's being designed in that way mm -hmm. to where we can actually do brand marketing. So what I mean by that is Shitty video games require you to market the game and just like try to get installs on the game because the brand is garbage. Illuvium, we can market the brand because it's so good and it's so compelling. And just by marketing the brand, it'll sell an entire suite of products and shows and services and whatever Illuvium has to offer. So therefore, just like Pokemon's IP is so strong, the characters are so iconic and designed so carefully, Illuvium has that as well. So yeah, the majority of Alluvium's revenue will eventually not be video games, in my in my opinion. Hmm. Uh, but once again, we don't know what the future holds in terms of monetization within the Web3 space. So it's possible that things like NFTs are just so effing lucrative that you know there's no way any merchandise strategy could exceed that revenue. Hmm. It's possible. I don't know. Uh, but I anticipate that that will be my, a minority portion of revenue. Will we produce... You mentioned cyberpunk edge runners. I specifically have messaged all three Warwicks <laughs> with cyberpunk edge runners as an example, a modern example of how a triple A show for a game can have significant marketing benefits. Like cyberpunk went up to 1 million concurrent players on steam after they released that show. And it was a dead game. And now sentiment for cyberpunk has gone from negative to wildly positive and people are thrilled about the expansion that's coming out and they've already crossed now 20 million copies sold of the game so the case i'm making internally right now is uh i want us to make i want us to make alluvium anime because we need more eastern appeal with our intellectual mm. property it's a very western ip um, it'll appear, it'll appeal in the East, but it's a very Western IP. And I think we need an anime version of it to market it to the East, to be honest. And obviously anime is popular in the West, of course, but to market it to the East, we need something like that. Uh, and Grant has told me, um, and I'll, I'll let him communicate what his plans are in terms of a triple A movie or show, but Grant Warwick is not going to walk away from Alluvium without having made without having made either a triple a movie and or a triple a show for alluvium yeah that's all i'll say about it i'm that's not going to say whether we're producing it right now i'm not going to say whether we have deep plans on it right now i don't want to set any expectations there but that's what grant told me uh so once again we need to focus on getting the games out and launching our first set of games but we have the talent on the team right now, especially with Grant Warwick, who has a AAA cinematic background and we have various talent here. Like we know that this intellectual property lends itself well to, to content formats like that. And so we want to make that type of content. It's not just about video games here. It's not just about video games at all. This is an entire universe and an intellectual property that will cross over every format. Soon we will be releasing the merchandise aspect of it. Mm. And you're going to start seeing each of these pieces get rolled out. I guess, I guess the part of that that I want to delve just a little bit deeper into is, is timelines. Now, obviously we're not asking for dates or anything here, but I, I always, I continuously ask myself, you guys are producing the game and the game's obviously taking a lot of time. How much of this stuff are you actually doing concurrently? Because now that we're seeing that you have two two or three games or whatever, and you have the merchandise that's being worked on, you have a few other DeFi type things on the back burner that are kind of being worked on. Are you working a lot of this side by side? And and when it comes to, okay, now we need to start working on the TV show. If you're not already, 
now we see to start working on the TV show. Do you then go and hire studios and things, or are you also going to work on a lot of that in house? So kind of what? It's hard for me to to kind of put into words. I understand what you're saying. So how do you prioritize all these things? Like if yeah. you're if you're if you're cooking so many things at the same time. So I can tell you, like right now, our team, like Grant and what have you, they aren't. They they're focusing on he's focusing on overworld right now. So like it's not like he's not we're not we're not producing a, an Illuvian movie right now. Okay. But that doesn't mean that the team isn't thinking about it and the team hasn't making plan like you can make plans for the future on something mm. without taking away from the task you're doing right in front of you right now, right? Yeah. So that's number one. Number two, when it comes to development. There's different layers of development that get done. There's there's like art development, there is 3D modeling, there's things like blockouts, there's the blockchain side, there's all these different layers. And so we are developing lots of different things at the same time because different personnel are developing different things that are in different stages at the same time. If we just did one product at a time, we'd have like a bunch of people just sitting around wondering what to do because their parts are already done. On a lot of what we're, on a lot of what we're creating, and so that so development is more fluid, and it has it's multi layered. So you've got multiple channels of development happening on multiple mm. products, not because you're spreading your focus, it's because different types of things needed to be developed for all of these different products. And by spreading it into layers and channels of development, you're actually developing all of it faster, and more effectively, and with resources in house, and so. People ask the question too, like they think that like by just a good analogy to answer your question, we do a, we do Alluvium showcase and Alluva talks, and I see comments on the video sometimes that say, "Why are you focusing on making this show? You should be releasing the fucking game." Mm. It's like you do realize that this marketing has zero impact on any products. So like just because you see some sort of activity happening in Alluvium in one area doesn't mean it has any impact on the thing you're thinking it mm. might have an impact on in another part of Alluvium. It's like then and, and then the, on the viewer side, the audience side, understandably, they're like, it appears to me that you guys are losing your focus. It's like, no, <laughs> this is just a different part of Alluvium doing something that doesn't mm. impact the other thing. It's like you are focusing on this. And maybe you wish we were talking about the thing that you want us to talk about, but that doesn't mean Alluvium Game Studio has lost their focus. Mm. So that's the best way I can answer that question. Yeah. Um, yeah. And at the end of the day, um, I think that like the number one priority for Alluvium is getting these three games out. And that's why mm. we've got beta on Arena, imminent beta on Overworld, beta, imminent beta, or, or very soon beta on Alluvium Zero. Got to get the beta testing done so we can launch these. That's the number one focus of everything. So if anybody sees any communications, if they see us posting a plushie, if they see me <laughs> talking in this interview about how, yeah, we have talked internally about doing movies and shows, does that mean that that delays the launch of Alluvium Zero? No, not by a nanosecond, it doesn't. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 100%. Um yeah, yeah, I guess the only, no, I, I understand that absolutely. And I, I understood that before as well. And I guess where my head was at is once the game is launched, you obviously have to keep working on set two and things like that. So where do you kind of find the people to produce that TV show? You know, so do you guys think you'll get more studios and things in on, on Alluvium or you'll just expand the team that far that you'll be able to do it? Or do you, do you kind of know kind of where the head's at there? Yeah, so I mean, if we were to do it, so, so any type of TV show or movie, Grant would be taking the lead on how we should source production mm. and how that should relate, relate to in-house assets. But I think gen in-house people working on it. I think generally speaking, you would have a couple key creatives within Illuvium right now, such as Grant, providing direction and ensuring that whatever's being produced on a TV show or a movie or something is in line with the lore and the branding and in line with whatever our business objectives are as well, right? Mm. Then, then somebody like Grant is going to make some key decision. He's either going to go psycho 
and decide to hire everybody himself, or he's mm. going to outsource it to some ice cold killer studio that he feels very confident in. That's up to Grant at that point. In the case of TV show or movie, he's, he's like the leading expert on that. Mm. So I don't know what the approach will be, but there will be a key trusted person, probably a Warwick making that level of decision, right? Just like Aaron would be making key decisions on, you know, like game design on the next title or whatever. And then Kieran would be making key decisions on when we're doing the next sale and generating revenue or investor decisions. So all that stuff is determined by a, those major decisions like that on whether we're going to hire in-house and ramp up resources or go outsourced and what have you. Those are, those are Warwick decisions that then go to the council. <laughs> like if we have to like source a bunch of money for something like, so for example, if we were going to need to hire an entire team to make a show or something, we would need to like work with the council on that. And like, that would be a massive expense and a huge focus. So, you know what I mean? So all those would all be considerations. Uh, so, yeah. so those are the two scenarios. You either have key creative talent in house providing direction to a fantastic AAA third-party studio. That's what Cyberpunk did. That's what CD Projekt Red with, did with the studio they worked with for mm -hmm. Cyberpunk Edge Runners. 10 out of 10. Like, that show was so good. Uh, it can work out if you have the right studio. Otherwise, who knows? With Grant, I don't know, man. Ask Grant. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I will definitely ask Grant that. Um, thanks. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for jumping on the show today. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to leave us off on? Nope. I always like talking to you. You're very thorough and in depth and <laughs> all the creators out there that watched, just go make some content, man. Just go copy what works to start with. And then it's all gravy from there. Awesome. Sounds good to me. All right. Have a good one, man. Adios.